can also be converted to text. Okay, so what's the problem with text? It's unstructured. Okay, so it lacks metadata, which means it can't be incorporated into a standard database field. It's still valuable, it's just harder to analyze. Sometimes it might be semi structured, so it's got a bit of both. So it's got a bit of structure. So, yes, we can take those uh, structured pieces and put those into a database. So, up here we see uh, Care Opinion, which is a uh, uh, a website that exists for uh, people to provide their uh, feedback to hospitals on or aged care on as well now. And some governments around Australia are using this as a way of getting patient feedback. Others, it's just open for anyone to comment on. So this part is the unstructured part. Someone uh, wrote something here. This part is structured because these are specific responses that they've clicked on uh, and it's come up with staff numbers, timely care, waiting time. So we could count the number of responses across many people relating to waiting time, as an example. That would be easy. How we uh, analyze that, that's a little bit more difficult. So it has a value, text has a value for evaluation. Uh, why? Because it's enabling the person who wrote the opinion or the piece of text or stated it, if it's a recording, uh, to use their words. It's not a tick box. It's not I'm having to respond to a predefined question with a predefined answer. So it enables emergence of unexpected patterns, patterns that either the evaluator or the researcher perhaps wasn't anticipating or even the org uh, organization that uh, might have engaged the evalu uh, evaluator might not be expecting and we can detect those and it can be used at scale so we can analyze many documents and many opinions within those documents so how do we what what can we generate you probably all have seen something like this it's called a word graph uh, and you can get free generators on uh, the web we'll you can cut and paste your text and put it in there or come up with a, a pretty picture like that. Uh, you can do that in more sophisticated tools as well. So that's a starting point. Uh, the size of the, the text indicates the frequency that the word appears. Uh, and these were the common words as we take them collectively over all the pieces of text that we analyze. Sentiment analysis, uh, you may have heard of. Think of it as, did I like it? So I've got a positive view of uh, the uh, whatever we're talking about, the topic we're talking about, or did I not like it? And I've got a negative view. Uh, sometimes I guess a, an easy way of describing this to uh, so you can visualize it. If you've been through uh, some of the airports where they have the smiley faces and the unhappy faces, it's like clicking on the, the smiley face, very happy, maybe just happy or the the uh, unhappy faces, okay? Um, what can exist and people perhaps don't realize is that a particular piece of text may be both positive and negative. So uh, it is possible to, to, to detect both within text, unlike the airport uh, style, simple click on the, the face uh, uh, data collecting points. Topic modeling uh, is where we collect themes and content analysis. Uh, you, and some of you may have heard of the software it comes from uh, Australia uh, called Leximancer, uh, where it looks at content. It digests lots of text and it can come up with uh, a social network type presentation uh, where it shows the relationship and you can create a story based on uh, the, the common uh, themes that are coming out of the text, as well as looking at the how uh, uh, frequently particular topics are, are in the text. We can also then take the, the text uh, analysis and put it into machine learning models for classification and prediction purposes and you know, take it one step further and potentially go into AI areas. But perhaps that's beyond evaluation and it's more into just the text analysis side of things. This is where I'm bringing something new in as opposed to the, uh, the conference presentation. So uh, I got my uh, PhD student Curtis to 
uh, do some analysis and he was doing a couple of health sites. Uh, and what he was struggling with was, well, how do I go about it? Well, we need a framework, but I can't find one. So uh, we came up with uh, the DATMAV framework. And yes, we gave it the name DATMAV. So we put some words across there that form a, an acronym. It's really about ensuring that there's a design uh, process that happens first. Why are we doing this? And as evaluators, we're we have to ask that question. Why are we here? What are we trying to do? So it doesn't matter whether it's uh, for pure research or whether it's for evaluation. Here, we're designing it. So in Curtis's case, he was looking at subreddits or he's looking at care opinion. He's got it for social media analysis. It doesn't matter, okay? You can just put the word text analysis in there and it's it's fine. So uh, we we're also interested in specifying it a time frame because on the web, depending on the uh, the source of the material, you can go back quite a way now. And if you do that, you're going to potentially capture a very large volume of data. You may not want all of that. You may only want very old data or you may want some very new data. So um, then you have to acquire it. If you're doing it like Curtis did, you, you scraped it. If you're using documents, the client may give them to you in electronic format. If it's a survey, then you're acquiring it through that process. This part here is sample if necessary. What we encountered with some of uh, Curtis's work was, well, we needed a supercomputer to actually analyze the data because he acquired so much of it. So uh, is there a better way? Can I sample? Yes, you can. Uh, and if you can sample, then you may only need to look at the sample data. Then you need to, uh, pre-process it. So text data on its own is great, but it contains a lot of words that have no meaning in terms of what we need to uh, look at. So we get rid of all the things like stop words. You'll see that in here, remove stop words. Things like a, it, is, the, all the words that we use to actually make our sentences make sense uh, and join up uh, nouns and verbs, we remove. Uh, we get rid of numbers, we get rid of punctuation, we uh, change uh, uh, the case to make it all lowercase, and uh, we sometimes remove uncommon words. Then we've got clean data. Once we've got clean data, then we can apply text analysis uh, modeling to it, and we can create uh, some analysis, and then we can visualize it to create things like the word uh, cloud or word graph that you saw before. So we now have uh, a framework for it, and you can access the pre-print uh, of that paper, the link's there, and if you can't write it down, uh, I'm quite happy for you to get these slides uh, afterwards so you can grab the link. So uh, what are the tools? Yes, you can read text, but not at the volumes that we're talking about now. Uh, you can use Excel. You can use Excel to do some quite limited uh, things like search term creation and uh, therefore creating a graph based on frequencies or heat maps, not just on the presence of words. You can uh, get some add-ins uh, such as Meaning Cloud and do it in Excel and uh, do sentiment analysis. You can use node-based programs such as NIME and Rapid Miner. Uh, and these programs are much more powerful than Excel. And they also mean that your workflow is documented and it's repeatable, uh, there's no mistakes. Uh, there is code writing programs such as R, a statistics package, and you can get very uh, specific uh, output software such as Luke, uh, Linguistic Inquiry Word Count, so it gives word count plus some other measures. Leximancer is the one that uh, I showed before that had the, the social network wordles. There's a whole variety of specific, almost single purpose uh, software. Why open source and no code writing? Well, R is really powerful. Uh, so is Python and uh, there's some other uh, packages out there as well now, uh, except you need to know how to code. And a lot of people in the evaluation space might be coming from backgrounds where uh, coding was not a requirement to complete their studies. So uh, that's a barrier. So rather than uh, coming up 
with uh, a coding option, there are now packages where you can get past uh, the uh, need to code. NIME is a really good example of that. And I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Open source means it's freely available uh, and uh, that's great. Some uh, of the packages have limited free access. So Rapid Miner is very similar to NIME, meaning Cloud has a free version, but it's quite limited. Uh, NIME is free and it's uh, not restricted in terms of what you can do. Uh, so Rapid Miner only lets you analyze, I think, 10,000 records at once. NIME, you can analyze as many as you can fit on your computer until you make it an enterprise option. Okay, once it goes enterprise, then there's a, a fee that they charge. But for me to run nine, I can run it for free. Okay, so it's easy to use. So what's it look like? Here we have, if you're familiar with Excel or maybe SPSS or uh, other packages that work with data in a traditional way, they have the data in columns and rows. You don't see that in nine. What you see is a series of nodes that are connected together uh, to make a workflow. So here we have a CSV file reader. So we read the data in, we process it. So uh, it just gets rid of some uh, basic uh, things like the stop words. We transform it, we get some frequencies. We're gonna get some aggregation occurring here and some color, and we create a, a word cloud. Uh, and we can have a tag cloud as well. There is no programming that you need to do this. All you need to do is grab the icons, drag them onto the, the workspace and connect them. Okay. The, uh, the only thing that you really have to do is specify sometimes limits on what you want. So if you want um, uh, infrequent words to be removed, how infrequent? Uh, is it a percentage? Uh, if it's the file that you're reading, where are you getting it from? So there's a way of pointing it to the right uh, file. So it's very easy to use and it means it's available to people who can't program, okay? So ideal for evaluators, it's free it, and it's easy to use. Uh, some steps in the text analysis, as I said before, that, that processing or cleaning, we remove numbers, stop words, punctuation, things like that. So it's in a consistent form. We then get frequencies, word graph, sentiment analysis. And that's when we take it into our evaluation or research work. This is a, uh, an example of uh, topic extraction. Uh, and I'll show you some results later uh, on topic extraction. So here it's a much more complicated uh, workflow. And it's not to say that this is not doable by an evaluator. It just means that there are skills and some knowledge that you need to go uh, to go and get or to learn uh, in order to get to this point. Uh, so you can create the output that you need. So the output, it depends on the analysis. I've just got a simple uh, word graph here. Uh, this is a word cloud developed from the care opinion data. Sentiment analysis, just a simple histogram. Uh, we all know what a histogram looks like, I hope. Now, so where, if I'm a new person to something like NIME, where should I begin? Okay. I can go to NIME. There's a few free downloads about first-time users. This is how you do it. Uh, Robert uh, Caldi, uh, Cadilly, sorry, uh, created a... Uh, a course that is free, how to use NIME in 66 days. And it's doing uh, simple tasks generally. So reading the text, making some charts, and it's building up the skills bit by bit, spending maybe uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes a day to do it. So you, you don't have to take 66 days, right? Um, but it's just limiting the time you spend on learning. So in two months, you can be pretty much uh, reasonably highly skilled at using nine. And you can do all these sort of things. That includes text analysis, okay? What about more advanced analysis? So uh, R and Python, uh, this is where you can find some 
really interesting things, but it requires uh, some, I guess, greater skill levels in terms of programming. So Kurt has created these diagrams. This is a heat map on uh, text coming out of uh, COVID uh, posts. Okay. And would we use this in a normal uh, presentation uh, or report? Probably not because it requires a level of skill to read it. And it looks pretty, and that's why I've included it today, but it's hard to interpret. This one, though, this is where we used word clouds uh, in the very beginning of COVID. Uh, and we looked at uh, what was being posted, and we could see that people were losing their sense of smell and taste very early on. And in fact, day one, this line uh, shows us what happens with the, the trend. Day one, a few people are talking about it, but not many. But by day seven or eight, it's peaking for those who are going to lose their uh, sense of taste and smell. And then discussion around it declines over time. So by day 14, and we were able to extract from uh, this particular uh, Reddit, which is a social uh, media platform, uh, the time that people were making these posts in terms of the day of their infections. So we could get a lot out of it. Another more uh, and piece of an, uh, analysis, more sophisticated analysis is looking at uh, the themes that emerge over time. So this related to looking at prostate cancer. So the initial sort of story arc, dad was diagnosed and a lot of the posts are about dads. Uh, sometimes it's a person themselves making the post, but often it's about dad. Uh, the left and mid, tends to refer to the position, the, the prostate, you'll see that we still get some odd terms coming up. Um, a lot of posts were made in January for some reason, and that's entered the text. And this is where having someone with content knowledge, as opposed to just a data scientist, look at it, because Curtis is a data scientist. He'll go, yeah, January's in there. Why is January in there, Curtis? Go back and understand the context. Gleason uh, scans, or Gleason does scoring. Score comes out again, scans. One of the early things you do is get a scan when you're getting uh, treated for prostate cancer. There might be some symptoms and uh, pain and blood, radiation therapy. We get past the some treatment and we're talking about uh, quality of life type uh, issues afterwards and relationships and uh, sexual function. Then uh, over time, we begin to talk about the doctors and the experience and payments uh, as well. So we can paint a, quite a complex picture all on the basis of unstructured text. And that has value. Now, it's easy enough to do, but one of the things to consider is your computer. So social media posts can be small but numerous. And that can very quickly amount to a lot of data. Uh, if you're working with books or published reports, so uh, Royal Commissions are, are a good example. Um, I've digested uh, various Royal Commissions using uh, Leximancer as an example. Uh, they contain a lot of text. So just be mindful of the what you're doing in that uh, sort of context. So I can do it on my laptop, but... If I'm going to be doing a lot of it and using a lot of text, I might want to get a more powerful laptop. So increase the RAM size, the uh, amount of memory in the computer, uh, or alternatively use a, a desktop computer to do it. So uh, the more sophisticated the analysis becomes, usually the, the greater grunt that you need in your machine to, to be able to do it. That is one of the downsides. Okay, ethical considerations. People often ask about that. Um, as Lewis, who gave a presentation to the SA branch recently, said, it's still the wild west out there in terms of using social media and text analysis. Uh, some ethics committees are concerned by it. Others are less concerned. It may be who owns the source of the data. Are people being identified? So uh, at Adelaide, for example, you can uh, use Twitter data uh, relatively easier or sub uh, or Reddit data easily. Facebook data poses a problem. Survey open-ended uh, open, uh, questions 
are more difficult because you've got to get the survey approved in the first place. So it just depends. Uh, is consent an issue? Well, usually people are posting of their own free will, but if you decide to uh, facilitate that by posing a question on social media, suddenly uh, consent might be a, an issue. So ethics is yet to be sorted in this space. So uh, no. even though it's doable, I still think there's a fundamental question. What is the evaluation problem? Why are we doing this? That design question. Is text analysis going to provide valuable insight? If yes, then we uh, proceed. If so, what text am I going to use? Is it a survey? Is it a report? Is it uh, from social media? So there's lots of options. And it, it's not just, uh, obviously, social media. It could be YouTube. It could be uh, videos. It could be anything that I can extract text out of. Platforms like Nine, free, easy to use. So it's accessible to you. So I, before we started, there was a PhD student. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, who's going to look at uh, potentially some text. Nine could be the perfect platform for you. Okay. The other thing, know when to call and help. So it does require some knowledge and it's easy to, enough to get. Uh, and it may be the experience in programming if you go for the more sophisticated stuff means you need to get a, a data scientist in to, to help. If I was starting again, where would I begin my journey? Well, I've used all of these books. Uh, this one's from Nime, it's a, a very good publication. This one, if you're interested in R, um, this is a great little book, uh, but it's also got some valuable pieces about using text anyway in it. Uh, Practical Text Mining got a is a, a wide-ranging book that covers a variety of platforms uh, for analyzing text. Uh, so yeah, this one probably uh, a good introductory book, maybe a little uh, too simple. Again, this one has some good nine examples. Uh, so uh, lots of resources there if you want them. Any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I, not just now, but afterwards, you can contact me uh, via my email. You can even ring me. My details are there. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening, and I'll hand it back to Greg. Awesome stuff. Thanks, Mark. Um, lots of uh, food for thought there. And um, what we might do now is get you know, people to um, to uh, just uh, ask questions um, of you, but I might kick it kick it off because I suspect quite a few people are like me that um, have over many, many years um, sat there with a handful or a large pile of survey open-ended survey responses or whatever and done the crude and rudimentary um, analysis to identify a bit what you were saying with your clients, come up with a few themes that have been identified and say, you know, here you are client, here's the four or five things. Um, when is that sort of crude and rudimentary approach advisable? And when's the, the more sophisticated um, approach that you've been talking about advisable? So I can move quite quickly now from the the crude and rudimentary, and uh, to uh, to doing sentiment analysis as an example, very easily and at almost no cost, even with a small amount of data. So if I was an Excel user, I might be keen to give Meaning Cloud a try. Okay, uh, just because it's easy, I can use it. Sure, I can't use it every day if I had lots and lots of analysis without buying it, but I certainly can use it uh, a few times a month. And for a small amount of data, it will give me some really interesting results. It will be able to get positive and negative sentiment out of my analysis on a more consistent basis than I can. Um, now, it's not to say I couldn't create a, a method to do it, but that method would vary each time. So, you know, there are pros and cons of sentiment analysis because we have a dictionary we use and it is working out whether the text is written in a positive or negative way. So if we're working in other cultures or other languages 
and we're using an English dictionary, sometimes that can be problematic. But let's assume that we're not, we're just dealing with English. Um, then I could do that very, very early on and get some incredibly powerful results. And I'd suggest doing it sooner rather than later because I've seen with clients the difference it makes. Okay. They, oh, we, had, we thought we had this, but it brings out some findings that they didn't know were there. Um, to get to the more heavy duty end of the world, when would I want to get there? Probably not for a while. Okay. And what sort of volume? The simple analysis uh, of sentiment, 100 records is more than enough. You can even do it on 50. Uh, you don't need a lot to be able to get value because once you're getting up to 50 responses, that's a lot for someone's head to take in and remember everything that's been said and work out whether it's positive or negative or how do I keep uh, work out what's the, the common response to you know, that word cloud sort of thing. So I'd be starting fairly early on. Uh, there are some simple tools to use first. Right? When would I go to nine? I'd go to nine reasonably early, but only if I was going to be uh, repeating things and I was interested in going perhaps to the next step. Um, so creating a word cloud, you can do easily enough uh, on uh, sites that do word clouds. But if I'm gonna do it over and over again, and I want sentiment analysis, and I might want to do some other analysis such as topic modeling, then I'd be learning how to do that sooner and have it in my toolbox so I can bring it out at any time. It's not hard to do. You just need to be mindful. If your computer doesn't have a lot of grunt, it can take a, a little while. So you might run it overnight. Uh, to give you an example, the care opinion data set that we've got is about 11,000 records. And some of those are significant essays. Some are just paragraphs. Um, so it's a pretty big file um, and that takes about four hours for me to run on a standard laptop. On a larger laptop, it's no big deal to run much quicker, uh, but I didn't get a lot of extra RAM in the laptop I'm using at the moment. So you know, it's horses for courses, but unless you put your toe in the water, you're not going to learn whether you, this course is for you, right? So um, you've got to give it a go. Right, and, and in, in your um, comments there, you did allude to uh, client reaction um, um, on POM presentation results, which preempted the next question I was going to ask is, you know, how, because often we, you know, we have sometimes clients and, and organisations are understandably sceptical about qualitative data. Um, how is how is the the use of some of these tools uh change that or does it change it so it's interesting you know, um in some ways we're, we're really entering a period of is it qualitative uh and i guess i prefer the term unstructured uh data in some ways why is that because it's a lot of data right um I'm getting up into the thousands and Lewis has dealt with millions of text records. Um, and so we're talking large numbers. And once you get to large numbers, we're you know, starting to talk more stats than just qualitative. So there is a, a maths element to this. Um, so unstructured. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, really useful. How did the clients react? Well, when you can present a graph uh, or something visual that shows them, say, positive and negative comments, you know, here's the, the graph that shows that we've got a lot more positive comments than negative comments. Uh, they, you know, they, they respond to that. When you add, and by the way, here's some of the text that are aligned to the, either the negative comments or the positive comments, then they go, oh, now I get why know what it means it's combining both not just either or it's still that yeah i still like to see so what do you mean a positive comment oh here's an example of some text that was rated uh, quite highly as positive oh i get it right so uh, they connect with it when they see both not just the graph uh, or say percentages of uh, positive comments but 
the number or graph plus some words. So combined. Okay, thanks, Mark. Let's open it up for um, broader questions. If I could just encourage people who do have their cameras off, it's always nice to have them on. You may not be able to or whatever, that's fine. I know Karen's got problems um, with her camera. But, um, and, uh, and and maybe put your iconic or other hand up. I know, Ken, you've already put your real hand up, so shoot, go for it. Thanks, Greg. Um, hi there, Mark. A um, the question I've got is around qualitative feedback, say in a survey, and the person will say, oh, I really like you know, aspect A, but in the same sentence say, but I dislike or I hate, or you know, this is terrible in terms of aspect B. So in your experience, how do you find statements like that and trying to code them or use, use the various software applications you have got experience with to filter that? So um, doing it to the, the I like A versus I like B, the sentiment analysis will pick up that in the one response, I've got uh, a positive and, and a negative view okay so and it's not uncommon that uh i should have preempted you know, uh that and had a few extra diagrams for you so it's not uncommon to see here's a distribution where we've got some purely negative some purely positive and a, a large group in the middle that have a, a bit of both what you can do with the text is also break it up okay so if that's your concern i I still can't tell, yeah, no, this person's mixed, right? Well, what does that mean? I can break out the text based on uh, the uh, use of full stops and create two fields, right? So I can break the text into to more pieces. I can't necessarily, unless you really knew that everyone's going to be talking about topic A and topic B and now, maybe it's you know fish versus meat or something where it's quite distinctive. I if it's looking for fish and meat, I can then break those sentences or phrases up based on fish and meat. Right. So uh, keywords or full stops let me break up the text. That would be the other way I would potentially start to handle that. Okay, Peter. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, Mark, for your presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, just as a bit of introduction, I'm an evaluation specialist at Australia's National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, which we call ANROS for short. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, Mark, I've dabbled a little bit in doing word clouds in R, and I've also done a lot of um, other kinds of text analysis or qualitative analysis, such as uh, conversation analysis, critical discourse analysis, and so on. And I'm interested to know with something like NIME, can we do analysis that shows how different uh, groups of people within our data um, have expressed particular views or sentiments or whatever? For example, suppose we had responses from both doctors and nurses. You know, could we show um, how their responses differ? In other words, can we sort of correlate with other variables in our data? Yep. So uh, uh, that sort of uh analysis is really easy in something like nine uh assuming that in your data collection you've got your text and you've got some other variables along with it so something to say i am the doctor i am the nurse i am you know, if that's there so i've got a whole lot of a lot of variables might be about, particularly if it's say from a, a survey, now here's my responses and one of them is my role. And here's an open-ended response where you've asked a question and have given a whole lot of text. Yeah, it's easy. It's trivial. Okay. You can filter it on the basis of the other variables. Okay. Yeah, uh, Candice. The dreaded not muted Candice. <laughs> you need to be <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark, for your presentation. Um, I had a question, I guess, in a similar vein to what Peter was mentioning before around working with, um, I guess, 
either culturally diverse or diverse, just diversity in your data set, um, or whether that's, you know, people in vulnerable situations as well. There's a particular level of um, sensitivity or cultural awareness that needs to come into your thematic analysis, um, I think, at some stage. Do you have any, um, I guess, resources off the top of your head? If not, we can chat later about um, deriving, I guess, like understanding the language side of things or like the meaning and, and um, uh, yeah, particular meanings behind the way people communicate. Because when we start getting into the, the AI-based stuff, they're not as savvy as humans when you start looking at idioms and double negatives and stuff like that and if we're for some of us if we're not working with large data sets that require that and you don't have a language background it's pretty challenging I think um, to work in a space to kind of derive meaning if you don't have that kind of structured or technical whether that's language or AI yeah so one of the you no know, one of the key things that comes out when you're reading particularly things uh, like sentiment about sentiment analysis is the notion that language matters, right? Uh, Australians are, are famous for uh, sarcasm um, and uh, the, that notion of saying something negatively, but it actually means the opposite uh, of what they're saying. So uh, how do we cope with that? That is still a problem. They're still training data, uh, which is used to build the libraries uh, for these analysis platforms. Okay, so many of the, the libraries come out of uh, universities from the states. Now, these libraries are being expanded. Uh, there's also the ability to add to the libraries. But as an evaluator, if you're doing this as a, uh, a consulting piece of work, be that within an organization or for an organization, you're not gonna go and say, oh, this is great, I'm gonna use this tool. And by the way, here's a, uh, the time we need to invest to create this library, okay? So there are limitations. You know, yes, um, I've given the overview, but you do have to be aware of, okay, we live in a multicultural society. What does that mean in terms of representation? Who, if you're using social media data, uh, as an example, uh, or blog posts, uh, who is writing on these posts? What's their background? What's their language? Is it representative? So Care Opinion, uh, the one that we've used uh, uh, in the, some of the examples there, you would say whoever is contributing to that is probably uh, from an uh, English-speaking background in Australia. Uh, they're probably reasonably well educated. So is it representative of everyone? This is where the volume suddenly becomes important. If we get enough messages, maybe that's less of an issue for picking up some aspects that we're looking at. Doesn't mean we ignore other ways of collecting data, but certainly, uh, yeah, it's not the be all and end all. Okay. Um, if I'm uh, looking at a survey, that's different. Then I can come back and say, okay, my survey went to a particular population. It had a structure like this. And yes, we did get the responses. And yes, we did allow for language. Uh, how do we capture the open-ended? Did those people who perhaps who didn't have higher uh, English skills not give us any uh, responses to our open-ended questions? We can look at that. You know, yes, there's a underwhelming response in our open-ended uh, survey question. Why is that? It was a difficult topic. Uh, our population was not gonna respond, right? Um, or couldn't respond. So yeah, there are challenges. Uh, they still exist. Um, that part hasn't been cracked. What has been cracked is some of the software that enables us to do some different uh, novel and maybe better analysis uh, is now available, but we're still going to grapple with the, the culture and language challenges. Thank you. We've got someone else who would like to ask. Go for it out. 
Um, with NIME, I haven't used the package, but is it uh, better suited to single users or does it facilitate a team uh, type arrangement? Okay. Um, as a single user, I can create a workflow and I can copy that workflow and give it to others to use, okay? Um, that doesn't necessitate me paying for nine or anyone else in my group paying for nine. If I wanted to have a platform for the enterprise, so it could be a small group of people um, where we share on a common workspace and collaborate and I build the model, but you can play with it without me giving you the actual model and uh, then you've got to pay for it. Okay. So it depends on how you're wanting to collaborate. Uh, so I guess uh, another way of viewing it is like Google uh, Docs. Yes, they've got their spreadsheet. Everyone can contribute to that spreadsheet that's left on the Google Drive if they've got access to the drive. That's one way of working. Or yes, I can have Excel on my machine send you the spreadsheet which is it that you want, okay? Um, so yeah, it's free if it's only on my machine. Yes, I still can share my workflow. I still can share the data that I'm using, but then you have to go and rerun the analysis, providing that that's you know not a hugely time uh, challenging uh, thing to do. I don't see a big deal on everyone having their own copy. Yep, thank you. Anybody else? I was just going to ask uh, Mark if you had any comments on Envivo as an alternative to something uh, else. Uh, no, I haven't. I guess Envivo still requires the the user to code. When I look at things like uh, what we've been doing, uh, what I've shown here is that notion of coding the text is taken away, away from me. It is using the underlying text to come up with the topics. Okay, so I'm not specifying anything apart from uh, here's the text. All right, I might uh, say there's some words I don't want to include in the analysis, or there may be some common acronyms I might want to add to the library. But beyond that, the analysis occurs. I do not specify what the topic should be. That comes from the data, not me saying here's my topics. Okay. So that is a difference. That's fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, 